Lee DuPont Company of Wilmington, Delaware, makers of better things for better living through chemistry, presents the Cavalcade of America. Tonight's star, Dean Stockwell as Theodore Roosevelt, Jr. Tonight's story, The Night There Was No President. Theodore Roosevelt came to the White House at the age of 42 with a young wife still in her 30s and six children. This is the story of the Roosevelt family, where they were and what they were doing the night there was no president. How many boys have there been who could say, my father is president of the United States? Not very many. But any boy, especially if he's 13 years old, would like to be able to. I know. You see, my name is Theodore Roosevelt, Jr. Now, according to my history book, a new president always begins in Washington, with people cheering and bands going by, and... Well, that's not the way it happened to my father at all. That's mine! It is not! It's mine! It's mine! It's mine! It's mine. There's more than enough for each of you at this table. Uh, we started all this. Boy, you heard your father. Yes, ma'am. Sorry. Theodore... I'm so glad you were able to come up to the mountains with us. Yes, so am I. Why, Edie, if somebody could have told me three days ago in Buffalo that I'd be here with all of you this morning, <laughs> I wouldn't have believed it. We didn't believe it either, that Father would be able to with us when we heard the terrible news. President McKinley had been shot. Father, who was vice president then, was in Buffalo for a whole week. But when it looked like Mr. McKinley would get better, Father joined us at the Tahawas Club in the Adirondack. And that's how on Friday, the 13th of September, 1901, my family was all together having breakfast. Father? Oh, Clinton, aren't you hungry? I'm hungry, but... Don't but... you want to grow up to be a mountain climber? Yes, Father, Well, but... then finish your oatmeal. Edie, any more coffee there? Are you watching the time, Peter? No, don't worry. I told young Robinson I'd meet him at 9 o'clock. Never been late for a mountain climb yet. In Switzerland, they have mountains so high you have to climb them with ropes. I'll not have you looking down your nose at Mount Marcy, sir. I'll have you know it's the highest peak in the state of New York. <laughs> <laughs> Father, can I ask you a question? Why, of course, Quentin. You may ask me a question. What is it? Father... Are we now the president? <laughs> no, son. We are not now the president. Mr. McKinley is going to be all right. That was such good news when the telegram came. Isn't it wonderful, Theodore? Such a relief to think he's no longer in any danger. Yes, it is. Indeed it is. Father, was this man, this person who shot Mr. McKinley, was he a young man? Yes, he was very young. Well, why did he shoot the president of all people? Didn't he like Mr. McKinley? Father, weren't you afraid to go to Buffalo? What do you mean? Well, sir, what I meant was, weren't you afraid someone would shoot you? Well, sir, I won't tell you I didn't think of that, Ted, because I did. But there are times when you can't afford to be afraid, even if you really are. All the same, I'm happier to have you here with us. Here, at least, I know you're safe. Well, Edie, I hope the time never comes when an officer of this country will be afraid to meet his fellow citizens on the street. What was that? What dropped? Sorry, Mother. Salt just fell right out of my hand. Oh, well, pick it up. Put it back on the table. Quick, Kermit. Throw some over your left shoulder. Of all days to spill salt, Friday the 13th. That's unlucky. Well, now, you, you mustn't be superstitious, son. You call a day like this unlucky? Why, look at it outside. It's beautiful. And we're all in good health and the good news about the president. Why, we haven't a worry in the world. It is a nice day to climb a mountain, isn't it, Father? That it is. And, Ted, one of these days, you and I will climb Mount Marcy together. Well, you'll excuse me. Mustn't keep young Robinson waiting. Will you be back by dinner time? Of course, of course. I'm having dinner with my family tonight. That is, uh, if I'm invited. I invite you, Father. Me too, Father. I invite sure, you, Father. Me too. Well, it looks as if the invitation is unanimous, Theodore. Well, then, I unanimously accept with pleasure. 
While Father went off to climb his mountain, without a worry in the world, something completely unexpected happened in Buffalo. Hello? Hello? This is Eddie Root. President McKinley's condition has changed for the worse. The vice president must be notified. Where's Mr. Roosevelt? How soon can he be reached? It was then that Mr. Root, the Secretary of War, learned that the vice president was 440 miles away, 40 miles from the nearest railroad station, and 10 miles from a telephone. But what Mr. Root didn't know was that he was even farther away than that, hours from our cabin, high on a mountain. Let's stop here a minute, Bab. Suits me, sir. Now we pushed a steady pace since we left the summit two hours ago. And we've a brook and a view. Oh, this brook is where the Hudson begins. You don't say. Hmm? <laughs> Never underestimate modest beginnings. Right? That's right, sir. <laughs> Looks like rain. Yeah, so it does. Well, we'd better push along, Bev. Here, I'll carry the rifle for a while. I'm sorry you haven't seen any game, sir. But these mountains are full of it. Oh, I didn't plan on hunting, Bev. One of the things I learned out west was always carry a rifle, not so much for the game you don't see if you do, as the game you're sure to see if you don't. <laughs> well, I'll remember that the next time I go hunt. What was that? Hmm, I didn't hear anything. Listen, there it is again. Oh, yes, I, I heard it now, Bev. Hello, over there. Where can I get across without waiting? Well, just above you, there's a log. Harrison Hall from the club. What brings you all the way up here, Mr. Hall? I have a message for Mr. Roosevelt. For me? I had uh, quite a time finding it. Oh, yes, has, has anything happened to my family? Uh, it isn't your family, Mr. Roosevelt. It's this telegram. Came to the club for you this morning. The yard, sir. Oh, thank you. Gentlemen, the president's condition is worse. I must return to the club at once. Meanwhile, back in the cottage at Tahawas, we were spending an afternoon with Mother. Archie managed to fall in the creek for the fourth time in ten days, and this frightened Mother almost to death. Then it was beginning to get dark. Edie! Edie! Theodore, what is it? Oh, Edie, Mr. Hall brought this telegram to me on the mountain. It's about the president? Yes, Edie, his condition is worse. Oh, Theodore. Has many word come here? I'm no, no, you. not a thing. Oh, what a time to be miles from the telephone. Well, Mr. Hunter's driving down to the telephone to pick up any word there. Oh, Edie, I came so far away from Buffalo. Oh, now, Theodore, you know you wouldn't be here if you hadn't thought the president was out of danger. Yes, yes, but And I, I know you can depend on William Lowe. You've always told me what a fine secretary he is. He's there, and he knows... You think I should it... leave right now, Edie? Did the message ask you to? No, 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 it didn't. And of course, it could be the president has just had a temporary relapse. I, I just don't want to bother those people again, Edie. Yes, I understand. Those two days I was there, I felt so helpless standing beside all those anxious people. I felt I... I... Well, I felt I was intruding. Then I think you should wait to hear from Mr. Lowe. But I'll pack your things just in case. Thank you, Edie. Edie... Do you know what I thought all the way down that mountain? What, Theodore? I thought if anything should happen, there will be those who'll say the vice president isn't old enough or wise enough. <laughs> but that's not what is important now. Nothing must happen to the president. That night, I couldn't sleep, no matter how hard I tried. I kept thinking about all the things that had been happening. It seemed so still and dark. And then, after a while, it started to rain. Dad! The thunder awakened Quentin, and I went to his bed. I'm scared. Shh, it'll be all right. It's just a thunderstorm. Oh, but what's going to happen? Is Father going away? Maybe. I don't know. But he'll get shot. I don't want Father to go away. No, he won't, Quentin. Remember, he was a rough rider. Don't you remember? Nothing will happen to him. Who is that talking? Shh, listen. Somebody's out there with Mother and Father. 
I think it's Mr. Hunter. Come on, let's see who it is. I almost thought for a while I'd never make it up here, I tell you. The rain was so bad I couldn't see a yard in front of me. But didn't they say anything else? No, ma'am. Just that the president is in a coma. Listen, did you hear that? But no official message for me? No no telegram? No, sir, no. When I talked to your secretary, he, he said that you ought to leave for Buffalo at once. Ah, oh, go on, get ready. <gasps> My brother's going away to get shot. Just like Mr. McKinley. Quentin, come back here. Quentin. <laughs> what on earth are you doing out there? I'm sorry, Mother. She heard voices. My brother's going to get shot. Oh, there, there, dear. <laughs> Well, you boys should be in bed. Oh, please, Mother. Can't we stay up until after Father leaves? Well, all right. Mr. Hunter, is the road very bad? Now, don't you worry, ma'am. My buckboard's in good condition, and that horse knows his way. Yes, but how is he going to get down the mountain? Well, the way we've planned it, it'll work like this. I'll take Mr. Roosevelt in the buckboard as far as the village. There, he'll change to a carriage that'll take him to Aiden's lair. Mike Cronin is standing by, ma'am, right now. And then? Then Mike will take over in his buckboard. Once they get to the North Creek Station, everything will be all right. They got the train waiting. Yes, but the weather and the mountain road. Don't you worry, ma'am. We ain't going to let anything happen to the vice president. There's a lot of mud and some places where the going is tough, but we'll get him there. If only he gets there in time. Before anything happens... Well, I'm ready, Mr. Hunter. I don't want you to go. I don't want you to go. Now, oh, there, there, son. <laughs> it'll be all right. I'll take this bag out, sir. Huh? Oh, thank you. Thank and I'll see you tomorrow, ma'am. Yes, Mr. Hunter. Now then, Ted, uh, you look after your mother. Yes, sir. And you boys be good. Do what she says, huh? Yes, yes father. Father. Yes, father. Bye, Don't worry. I'll get there in time. I've got to. At breakfast next morning, even Quentin didn't make any noise. Mother kept telling us that Father would send us word as soon as he could. Mr. Hunter would bring it. We should be patient and not to worry. So after breakfast, we children took turns watching for the trail for Mr. Hunter. It was just past noon. Mother, he's coming, he's coming. Oh, at last. Are you sure it isn't somebody else? Come and see. Oh. You look at that wagon. I'll bet you couldn't pry that mud off with a crowbar. Easy, easy, well, Mr. Hunter, is, is, is everything all right? Now, ma'am, you've got nothing to worry about at all. Mr. Roosevelt boarded the train for Buffalo at 5.30 this morning. 5.30? He traveled all night. And in that storm. Here's a telegram, ma'am, from Mr. Roosevelt. Sent at 7 o'clock this morning. Oh, thank you. Twelve hours they held that train. Full steam up. Did you hear that, Mother? They held the train for... <gasps> Mother, what is it? President McKinley died at 2.15 this morning. Right on Cavalcade of America, Dean Stockwell is starring as Theodore Roosevelt, Jr. in The Night There Was No President. It is September 1901. President McKinley has just died. In Buffalo, a presidential cabinet without a president prepares for the ceremony that will make Theodore Roosevelt the 26th president of the United States. In the meantime, in the small mountain cabin in the Adirondacks, Mrs. Roosevelt and the children eagerly question Mr. Hunter. How long did it take you, Mr. Hunter? I'd sure like to keep a locomotive full steam up for 12 hours. Did you break a record, Mr. Hunter? No, not me, lad. That horse of mine must weigh 1,400 pounds. It took us two hours to make the lower works. Well, that's a record, nine miles in two hours. Ma'am, I talked to the men who work the relays, and they say that your husband is one of the nerviest men ever. Sure he is. Because he's a rough rider. <laughs> Archie. Well, it seems there was this place in the road where a log was kind of across it. One side was a drop, about 75 feet. 75 feet? Cronin wanted to stop the horses. But you know, ma'am, Mr. Roosevelt wouldn't let him. He said, I'm not afraid if you're not. Push ahead. Uh, he'll make a fine president, ma'am. President? My father is president. 
He's my father, too. He belongs to all of us. <laughs> well, Miss Roosevelt, I suppose you'll be leaving us here at the club and going to the White House. Yes, I suppose we will be leaving. Yeah. Well, whenever you and the children want to be taken down the mountain, why, the buckboard will be ready any time at all. Well, that's very kind of you, Mr. Hunter. We'll be going home to Oyster Bay first, as soon as we can get packed this afternoon. Mother, do you think Father's in Buffalo right now? Well, um... Could he be there this early, Mr. Hunter? The train ought to get in by 2 o'clock. Well, it's 3 now. Oh, dear. I just realized. What do you suppose he'll wear to take the oath in? He certainly can't wear that suit he has on. It must be spattered with mud. <laughs> Don't you worry about it, ma'am. He'll make out all right. But it's just a shame that you and the children can't see the president take the oath. Why, ma'am, this is history. Yes, Mr. Hunter. It is a shame. I would like to have had the children see their father at a moment like this. Yeah. Well, I'd better get over to the club. But don't forget now, Miss Roosevelt. When you and the children are ready to leave, you let me know, huh? Thank you, Mr. Hunter. Goodbye, Mr. Goodbye, Mr. Hunter. Goodbye, boys. Goodbye. Mother, if father had been elected president, could we have watched him take the oath? Why, yes, Ted, of course. Well, now, children, the first thing for us to do is pass. You know who administers the oath, Mother? The Chief Justice of the Supreme Court in a row. Ah, oh, how do you know so much? I read it in my history book. I'm glad you reminded me, Ted. You children be sure to collect all your school books. We don't want to leave any behind. Is the White House really white? Of course it is. Anybody knows that. Mother, Mother, mm -hmm. aren't we going home ever again, ever? Of course we're going home, Quentin. And then we're all going to a new home. All of us? Even me? Of course, Quentin. We're going to be together just like we've always been. Aren't we, Mother? Yes, dear. We'll be together as we've always been. Only well, we now we'll be together in the White House in Washington. I know lots of people who live in White Houses. What's so great about living in the White House? Well, Archie, the White House is a symbol. While we live there, everything we do and everything we say will be an example to people who live in White Houses and Brown Houses. And gray houses all over the country. And that goes for people who live in apartment houses, too. Doesn't it, Mother? Be quiet, Kermit. Mother's talking now. Well, children, we can discuss all this later. Right now, I want you boys to gather all your things together and stack them on your beds. Everything, Mother? Everything. Let's get started right away. Go on, now. Well, Ted, you'll be sure that nothing is missing. Toys, games, and books. And then what'll I do? Oh, well, just keep the boys entertained. And away from that brook. Uh, Mother... Yes, dear? Do, do you feel in, funny inside like I do? Just how do you feel funny, Ted? Well, I don't know exactly. Mostly it's in my stomach, I guess. I think I understand. This is a very special day, Ted. From this day on, all our lives will be different. <laughs> I'll never forget Mother saying that. From this day on, all our lives will be different. In front of Mother, we children were serious. But during the rest of the day, when we were by ourselves, we made all kinds of plans for living in Washington. Archie told Kermit that chocolate cake was served three times every day at the White House. I saw myself standing straight and tall beside Father while he made laws and visited with kings. I made sure of all our belongings were ready for Mother to pack. And then I picked up my history book. My history book. I can't find my Indian arrowhead father gave me. Well, I haven't got it. It's right there on the bed. Oh, thanks. What are you doing with that history book, Ted? Come on, put it on the bed with the rest of your things. Does he really wear a robe? Who? The Supreme Court. Oh, you mean the Chief Justice. Here, I'll prove it to you. Right in this book. Here's a picture, see? Well, that man doesn't have a robe on. Not him. He's the president. That's Mr. Cleveland. He was a president a long time before Mr. McKinley. We surely have lots of presidents. Sure. And father's one now. He's got to take the oath of office just like that, too. I'll bet your father's taking the oath in Buffalo right now. Wish we were there to see him. Listen, I've got an idea. What, Ted? If we can't be there to see father, we'll pretend we're there. You're crazy. No, I'm not. We can do the oath ceremony right here. We don't know what it is. Yes, we do. It's in the book. I'll be father. Who can I be? Well, let's see. Somebody's got to be the justice. I'll be the justice. No, you're not. I'm the justice. I've got a robe on. That's just a blanket and you know it. Ted? Who are these other men in the picture? These? They're cabinet members. 
You know, like Mr. Knox, the attorney Mr. general. Mr. Ruler, cabinet member? Well, sure, he's secretary of war. He found a frog once with a $5 gold piece. Right, Mr. Archie, Ruler? you settle down and be serious. All right. I'm going to be Mr. Ruler. Let Archie be the justice in his old role. All right, let's start. Right now in Buffalo, this is what's happening to Father. He's taking the oath of office. You stand here, Archie. Will the cabinet please stand here? That's you, Mr. Ruth. Oh, right here? Archie, you read the oath in the book. Stand here facing me and say to me, just like the justice is saying to Father, raise your right hand and repeat after me. Raise your right hand and repeat after me. Now, you read the oath down here at the bottom of the page. Just fill in the blank space like this. I, Theodore Roosevelt. All right. I, Theodore Roosevelt. I, Theodore Roosevelt. Do, uh, what's this word? Solemnly. Do solemnly swear. Do solemnly swear. That I will faithfully, uh... Execute. Uh, execute the office of President of the United States. That I will faithfully execute the office of President of the United, United States, States. And will... I will, to the, the best, best of my ability, will. preserve, protect... And defend the Constitution of the United States. So help me God. Congratulations, Mr. Oh, President. Yes, congratulations. May I offer Thank my congratulations, Mr. Thank President? You. Thank you, gentlemen. Uh, when will you be starting for Washington, Mr. President? I don't know, Ella, who. Much to be done. But right now, I'd like to send word to my family. <laughs> And so we learned that Father became the 26th President of the United States in a borrowed frock coat. And then, later, we moved to our new home, the White House. It seems strange to all of us, even to Mother. I remember one day I overheard a conversation between Mother and Mr. Cleveland, one of our former presidents. He was standing beside her, and just as I came by, I saw him take her hand. It is a large place, but after a while, it'll seem less a museum and more like a home to you. Do you really think so, Mr. Cleveland? <laughs> well, I felt lost here at first, but only in the beginning. You'd feel this way about moving into any new home. It's not only the bigness and strangeness, but... Oh, Mr. Cleveland, my husband is so young. Don't worry. Don't you worry at all. He's going to be all right. I'm sure if Mr. Cleveland said he was going to be all right, he would be. But just the same, there was something about Father that worried me. I wondered if now that he was president and belonged to all the people, if he was still my father. It wasn't until one night at the dinner table, the first evening we were all together, that my worries were answered. All of us children sat around kind of quietly. We looked at each other and didn't say much. May I have a salt, please? Certainly. Thank you. May I please have more bread? Well, what, what's going on around here? What are you all looking so serious for? Well, Father, now that we're in the White House and everything... Now can... that we're in the White House? Oh, well, nothing's going to change because we're here. Why, well, boys, this is our home. <laughs> And then I knew it was all right. From then on, it was our home. That's mine. It is not. Archie, it is so. it is not. Archie, there's enough dessert for each of you. Oh, yes. Sorry, sir. Yes, sir. Father, can I ask you a question, sir? Yes, Quentin. You may ask your father one question. Father, are we now the president? <laughs> Yes, sir. We are now the presidents. Our thanks to Dean Stockwell and the Cavalcade players for tonight's story, The Night There Was No President. Next week, the DuPont Cavalcade will present the exciting story of a woman whose faith in a man defied catastrophe 
and whose love led him to a place in America's Hall of Heroes. Our star, Dorothy McGuire. Our play, Thunder of Justice. Be sure to listen. Tonight's DuPont Cavalcade, The Night There Was No President, was written by Evelyn Nolt and based on the articles Theodore Roosevelt's dramatic dash into the presidency, written by Herman Hagedorn, and published and distributed by the North American Newspaper Alliance. Original music was composed by Arden Cornwell, conducted by Donald Voorhees. The program was directed by John Zoller. With Dean Stockwell tonight, our cavalcade players were Ian Martin, Philip Rod, Gertrude Warner, Sarah Fussell, Butch Cavell, Robert Dryden, Guy Rep, Parker Fennelly, Ed Jerome, and Jack Edwards. This is Cy Harris speaking. Don't forget next week, our star, Dorothy McGuire. The DuPont Cavalcade of America comes to you from the Velasco Theater in New York and is sponsored by the DuPont Company of Wilmington, Delaware, makers of better things for better living through chemistry. Next, Hollywood theater stars Jeff Chandler on NBC. Mm-hmm.